All right, as I said, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for, I think I'm a clone now, item cloning strategies for secure testing. Caveon is really thrilled to welcome our guest presenter today. Her name is Lisa Hertzinger, and she is the Director of Exam Development and Analysis for the Institute of Internal Auditors, or the IIA. And in that role, she manages exam development, translation, publication for the IIA's flagship exam, as well as four specialty designations. And she's joined today by one of Caveon's own, Patrick Martin. He is our assessment project manager, and in one of the hats that he wears in Caveon, he is one of our professional item writers and an expert cloner. So he'll be talking today on some different tips and tricks that you can use to clone items successfully. As I mentioned, we will be recording this session. So for those of uh, your colleagues who could not make it today, um, we will have a recording for you to use. And uh, lastly, if you do have questions within, uh, as our speakers are speaking today, go ahead and put them in the question box, and I'll be communicating those questions to our presenters. Um, all your lines are muted, so the best way for you to ask a question is through that question box. Uh, Rochelle, let's go to the next slide. And we're going to go to our first poll here. We thought we would um, get an idea of what our, who our audience is today. So I'll la launch our first poll question, which is, who is in our audience today? Um, are you an item developer, a program or project manager, manager of test development? We'll wait and see. We'll watch as these uh, as the poll starts, the results start to come in, and then we'll share those results. Okay, it looks like everybody is just about finishing up. And it looks like um, we've got a, a, a kind of a spread of people here today. Some item development, some managers of test development, some project management, and then we have some other folks as well. Let's go to our, our next poll question. And this question is, does your testing program currently clone items? Just a simple yes or no here. We'll kind of get a pulse of what people are doing in terms of item cloning. Okay, we'll close the polls. So it looks like the majority of the organizations represented today aren't doing a, a, a whole lot of cloning. And let's look at our last question here. If, for those of you who do clone, what are some of the reasons that you clone items? Do you need to extend your item pool? Are clones needed to create multiple forms of a test? Did you have test items that were, were stolen? Maybe some of you haven't cloned before, but you'd like to start. And you're looking for ways to get started. Okay, looks like we're just about finished here. I'll close the poll and share the results. So again, most, most people have not gotten started yet with cloning, but they would like to. And for those that are cloning, many of you would like to extend your item pool. So we'll go ahead and close those results. And Rochelle, let's go to our next slide. And I'd like to turn the time over now to Lisa Hertzinger. Lisa? Thanks, Amy. I appreciate the invitation to join the webinar today. I'd like to share some information uh, from our experience here at the IAA, and, and we are cloners, so I just want to start off by giving a little bit of perspective of the program I represent. As uh, Jamie covered in, in my introduction, uh, we do have a flagship exam. It's called the Certified Internal Auditor, and uh, that exam uh, is a three-part multiple-choice exam. It's computer-based testing. We do not have windows. We offer the exam globally year-round in 105 countries and 17 languages. So it's quite a large program. Uh, we are celebrating the 40th birthday this year of the CIA. 
and we have approximately 110,000 people certified worldwide. Um, and as Jamie also mentioned, we have four one-part specialty exams, not in as many languages, but uh, clearly a large program and a need for uh, a large bit of content. So uh, that being said, next slide, please. We uh, didn't decide overnight to come into cloning. It's been a, a bit of a maturity model uh, for us, and it was just recently last year where we were ready to start and take on this strategy. So that's the uh, perspective I'll be sharing with you. In 2008, here we transitioned from paper and pencil to CDT. And then in, uh, we spent a couple years really refining and, and working through some of those processes to make sure they were streamlined. And then in 2011, we started to, again, focus on exam maintenance as a, as a strong strategy and, and think about where we wanted to go with that. So by 2012, we were ready to think about cloning, and uh, we started to do some work with Tavion to research cloning with them and took that on as a strategy. So I'll be talking about our 2012 experience and then where we're at now into uh, 2013. So you can see from this, we, we uh, started with the basics of our program. We got the blocking and tackling down. And then when you're ready for the continued maintenance as a strategy, um, we were ready to take on cloning. Next slide, please. And as we were making this decision, and for those of you who have not yet decided to start cloning, you will come about the decision in your own way, but I wanted to share these six factors which were a main part of our program's decision on why it makes sense for us to take this on as a strategy. Um, at the end of the day, I do represent, as Jamie said, the Institute of Internal Auditors, and as a former auditor myself, I clearly think in terms of risk management. You'll see that play out in my comments. Um, and, and I really focus on uh, ROI and how we can best use um, efficient resources to meet our objectives. So when I think about these six that help us make our decision, um, and specifically cost of development as one of the main, um, we all know, those of you that work with item development, it's very, very expensive. And with the volume of the programs that are represent, we certainly have a need to continuously uh, create uh, new content and update it to keep our exams fresh and current and relevant in the profession. And because that's so expensive and time consuming, cloning is a great strategy for us. Content security is also um, an important strategy for us. Just because of the number of languages, the number of countries we're in, and the volume of our exams and our content, I'm inherently taking on security risk, and I'm very aware of that. So um, as a proactive strategy, cloning again makes sense from a security standpoint. Briefly mentioned it, but uh, again, to keep our content fresh, to keep it relevant, to keep our exams valid and credible, cloning again, having more content helps you achieve all of those additional um, objectives that you're after with your exam program. So that was very important to us. And pretesting strategies were also part of our decision. There are a lot of different ways to pretest items, whether it's beta, whether it's uh, unscored items included in your exam. You can adjust your cloning model to match and fit with or leverage different pre-testing strategies. So that was certainly a concern, and that's an expense. And we were able to modify the model so that that worked in a positive fashion for us. So that was a big win. Um, the fifth point is leveraging technology. Um, depending on where you are in your program and how it's evolving in your own maturity model, um, it depends on, on how you can leverage technology for your cloning strategies. Um, we have a wonderful item bank tool that allows us to do a lot of work, uh, to divvy it up, to do the review, to do it remotely, to do it virtually, and to leverage the right people in the right places and be very efficient. So we've been able to facilitate our gap analysis, to facilitate assigning out items, um, and, and technology is a really large part of this, and it's a secure part of this. So um, a great enabler and a great enhancement there. And then lastly, again, falling back uh, with my auditor hat on, I am always looking at how we can best use our staff and our resources, not only for exam development, translation, and publication, but new certification strategies and moving forward. So if, if this is an efficient way for us to create content, that frees up resources for me to do some other great things uh, with our team here, focus on our analytics, and like I said, uh, new strategies. So, um, again, you may all come to the decision in your own way. You may have had similar factors you considered or others you need to add to the list, but I just wanted to share that this was how we came to our decision. Next slide, please. 
Hey, Lisa. This is Jamie yeah. Mulkey. Um, I just wanted to check with you. Are you using a, a headset or a speaker right now? I'm using a speakerphone. Um, if we could ask you to switch to a headset, that would be great. And I, we did get a comment. If you could slow down just a tiny bit, that would be great. I sure can. Thank you for that feedback. Okay. If we uh, focus on the process, um, a couple of comments that I have uh, related to this, and Patrick really will be uh, sharing his expertise and getting uh, further into the, the process steps. But we did partner with Tavion and with a professional item writer, and we had the fortune of working with Patrick. I uh, certainly agree with Jamie. He is an expert. Um, and we shared our references with Patrick. We also shared our objectives for cloning, for what we were trying to achieve. Um, and we were very focused on specific items and, and content that we wanted cloned. So we, we shared and drove that process up front. Um, and then uh, after Patrick was able to work with us and uh, share his expertise cloning the items, we held our first review in person with our subject matter experts to really understand the process better and have that full communication and feedback and education loop, which is very important. I'll talk about that again shortly. And after a successful start off, and it was very successful for us, then we uh, continued the process. We continued cloning, continued our partnership with Cavion, and we moved forward on a virtual basis for our review uh, processes. So that's how it worked for us. We had one in person and then continued on a virtual, and it's been working very well. Next slide, please. Tips for buy-in. Again, uh, from the polling, some people are already in process, but for uh, those who are considering starting this and are on the beginning stages of cloning, um, one of the things we focused on was not only partnering with Cavion, but partnering with our longtime valued subject matter experts. So this was certainly uh, not about replacing them. They are very valuable. It was about uh, leveraging them and augmenting their capacity and elevating their role. So they are now able to focus on strategic priorities and final sign-off. Um, but as far as doing additional work and additional writing, we can leverage um, a professional writer and a partnership. So they were very pleased with that. Uh, they liked the transition. They loved their new role. And at the end of the day, our turnaround time on item development and creation is, is much faster. So uh, that's, that's a fantastic win on all fronts. Host a working session with your SMEs. We certainly did that um, for the first session. And this was a great idea, again, not only for education and mentoring and buy-in, but um, we were able to adjust our processes as we needed. And again, some of our longtime uh, experts that have been writing for us learned new information as well and learned new strategies that we, we had never considered. So that was great so by um, sharing the tips from the professional writer with our SMEs, they also became better reviewers, which has uh, led us to a higher quality content. Again, a big win across the board. Um, and lastly, ensure two-way communication. I know I've used the term partnership quite a few times, and, and that, that is what it is for us. It's a partnership between us and Cavian, us and our professional writer. It's a continuous improvement, and it's a partnership uh, with our subject matter experts. So uh, make sure you have that uh, full feedback loop and you find a great trusted advisor that you can work with. And next slide, please. Um, and the results. In uh, case you're wondering how this has worked out for us, it has worked out very well. As I mentioned briefly on the last slide, our sneeze found the, uh, the process uh, very valuable. Uh, and, and again, Patrick will speak to the process, but he shared a lot with us up front about his methodology for cloning, and that helped our SMEs learn and be involved throughout the process. Uh, personally, as the director of this program, um, I find it very valuable that you can put a science to it and really enhance the professionalism and the credibility of the content. So, uh, and in fact, it's been such a solid learning process for us and feedback process for us that even as a staff now and as volunteers, uh, some of the basic level cloning we can do ourselves. We certainly look at items differently and look for and request the type 
that can be cloned um, that's providing some great great growth for us and then allowing us to think about the next tiers of more advanced cloning. So we're very happy about that. Um, again, cost is always important. Uh, so we've increased our inventory of items for less than what new development would be. Development is very expensive. And when you think about uh, if you pay your authors time spent on review and revision, subject matter expert time, pre-testing, all of those costs come together are highly expensive. So um, to focus on cloning as a strategy, even with a shoestring budget, uh, it's very affordable, and, and you'll be surprised at your ROI. Um, and I, I have to say that the personal bias I brought into this was that uh, only subject matter experts from our field will be great writers of content. How can someone who doesn't understand our profession be a great writer? And Patrick proved us wrong time and time again. Um, and is able to bring, again, such a high level of professionalism and expertise and leverage our resources that the quality is absolutely fantastic and it brought us to a higher level of consistency. So that was a big win for us. And uh, last slide for me, please. All right, just a couple other comments on our results. Again, high level of consistency, which is great not only for me and for statistics, but it's also great for the candidates and the credibility and the professionalism of the exam. So a big win. Um, I think if you're involved with item writing, you're very aware that it's difficult to find people that enjoy it and are wonderful writers and great contributors um, for the profession. So. Um, while they are fantastic subject matter experts, they may or may not be uh, fantastic writers. So leveraging a professional writer, again, allows you to smooth out and enhance your content. Um, so the, uh, we've been able to focus on different strategies rather than burning out our few and proud of needs that are they're very, very good at what they do. Um, so that's where we're at. And, and that was our experience in 2012. In 2013, we're certainly continuing. And uh, we're enhancing that partnership, too, to think about additional item writer training, because um, it's great to clone content, but you want to clone high quality content. So we're really focused on training our item writers and uh, getting great content in. Because at the end of the day, and, and my last point here is, my objective is uh, moving us along an item writing maturity model. So rather than uh, going from trash to treasure and cloning poor things and trying to make them better, I want to have great content that I expand and now I've got two or more um, great sets of content. So I'm, I'm really focused on quality and statistical validity. So that has been our experience. And uh, again, it's, it's largely in part due to a great partnership and the expertise of Patrick as well. So with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to Jamie and Patrick. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we've been getting a number of questions in the question box, and they relate to well, how do you you know how do you how do you define a clone, and how do you use clones as part of a, a test security strategy? Um, I'll let Patrick talk about um, some of those ideas, and then we can we can also address some of those questions at the end. Patrick, I'd like to turn the time over to you now. Patrick, as I mentioned is our, um, one of our assessment project managers for Cavion and also uh, on our professional writing staff. Patrick? Thanks, Jamie. And um, thank you, Lisa, for uh, all the uh, kind words. I really enjoyed the partnership that we uh, built with the IIA. Um, OK, so it's the main thing to get across cloning. Uh, it can also be referred to as variance. And what we're doing is taking an item and changing it in such a way so it basically test the same information, uh, but it would be unrecognizable to someone who's seen the item before. Um, and so we have a lot of strategies for doing that. And I was going to go over not a comprehensive list of the strategies I employ to um, clone items, but these are probably the, the big ones, the ones I go to most often and the ones that when I'm training fellow writers that I recommend that they go to most often. Uh, so. With that in mind, let's dive into the examples. So could I have the uh, next slide, please? OK, so the first strategy is changing the item so you get a new correct answer. And here I've got a sample item. Um, 
that I'll read for you and talk about a little bit. So a trainer notices that during a heavy barbell squat, the client's upper back rolls over as the client comes out of the bottom of the movement. Which verbal cue should the trainer deliver to help correct the problem? A, chest up, B, eyes up, C, shoulders up, and D, heads up, or head up. So the first thing I do if I'm presented this item and I'm told that I should clone it is I would go and I'd look at the answers, the answer and the answer options. Uh, are the distractors and the wrong answers? And what I'm looking to see is, A, are these all valid cues? Can they, do they serve a purpose within training? And B, is it possible for me to change one of change the stem to make one of the other answers correct um, in such a way that I don't accidentally make all the other answers correct and also that I'm still supporting the uh, objective. So if I could have the next slide. So here on the um, right we have what I changed. I discovered that yes, these are all valid cues and yes, I could actually change the item and support the objective. And so you'll see the differences in red. A trainer notices that during a heavy goblet squat, the client tends to get momentarily stuck at the bottom of the movement. Which verbal cues should the trainer deliver to help correct the problem? And so now the correct answer is B, eyes up. Notice that I really didn't change too much in the item. I've left all of the answer options the same. I just made a new one correct. And I tried to keep as much of the original language of the item intact. Now the reason you do this is from a security perspective is we've now got an item that's going to hopefully trip up some of the people who cheated by getting prior knowledge of the exam. Um, they'll be reading quickly and maybe, hopefully they'll see it heavy and squat and go, oh, that's the chest up. Um, when someone who hasn't seen it and reads it through will be able to get to the eyes up. Um, we found that this is probably the most effective clone type and it's the easiest to do. The only real problem with it is that not every item supports this cloning type. You'll get um, for a number of reasons. Uh, so if you want to use it exclusively, you're going to have to do a little bit of screening of your item bank um, or the original items and make sure you're choosing ones where it is possible to change it to another distractor. Uh, if you need to go beyond that or you just want to use your entire bank without screening, then there are other strategies that can come into um, play and still create uh, effective items. So let's take a look at the next one. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is a variation of the new correct answer. We have another question, kind of similar to the last one, uh, in that it's presenting a scenario and asking what you should use. So a woodworker is building an adjustable shelf bookcase for a client who has requested that the frame be assembled with miter joints and that no screw holes or nail holes be visible when the cabinet is finished. Which joinery method should the woodworker use to assemble the cabinet as requested? And we have A, biscuits, B, pocket screws, C, dados, and D, dovetails. Um, so again, as the cloner, I would go through and I would look at the answers and see what I can change. Um, and what I'll discover is that pocket screws aren't visible, dados really don't apply to the type of cabinet tree that we're going for, and dovetails don't really work either. Or they both can kind of work, but I can't actually change the item so dados is 100% right and dovetails is 100% wrong. Um, but what I did do when I was discovering, and this is why it's important to send reference material to whoever's cloning, um, was that there other uses I can, um, there's another answer I can make correct, but I just have to change some other things. Uh, so if I can have the next slide, please. So now I have this item. Um, a woodworker is building an adjustable shelf case for a client who has requested that the frame be assembled with simple butt joints and that no screw holes or nail holes be visible when the cabinet is finished. Which joinery method should the woodworker use to assemble the cabinet as requested? And so now the correct answer is dowels. Um, and again, I left most of the frame or stem pretty much intact. In fact, in this case, I just changed out um, a couple of words. But notice down in the answer options that I've also now swapped out all of the distractors. And the reason I did this is, uh, again, for security. If there's a prior a candidate with prior knowledge, they might not remember 
they might remember the other distractors. And so they get this question right by going, well, I know everything else is wrong, even though that's not the answer I remember. Um, so you just have to flip it out. Uh, in the best case scenario, you tra change out all the distractors, but sometimes all you can do is change out two. It really depends on what material is available uh, and what your rules are for using or for crafting distractors. Um, okay. So again, this is a pretty strong and effective cloning technique, um, but again, not every item type will lend itself to it. So you have to then, if you can't do a new correct answer, start getting creative. Um, and so let's take a look at some of those strategies. If I could have the next slide. All right, flipping the answer into the stem. This is one that I really uh, use often and find that it uh, can be pretty effective. So let's look at the item. So an analyst is evaluating a stock for possible inclusion in a portfolio designed to provide stable income. Which of the following metrics should the analyst ascertain in order to ensure the stock will meet the requirement of providing stable income? We have A, payout ratio, B, price to earnings, C, free cash flow, and B, book value. So all of these are valid um, metrics, and I could probably actually use the make a new answer correct strategy, but for the purpose of this example, let's pretend I can't. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that payout ratio and I'm going to make it part of the question, and then I'm going to rewrite a new answer and distractors um, based on it. So if I could have the next slide. All right, so here we have the new one. Um, an analyst is evaluating a stock for possible inclusion in a portfolio designed to provide stable income. For what reason should the analyst determine the payout ratio? And now the new answer is A, it is an indicator of the company's ability to maintain the dividend payment. And then I just created new distractors that are also valid um, and would work. So again, we're getting at the same information, but we're just taking a slightly different approach. Uh, someone who knows what a payout ratio is will be able to answer this question. Someone who just memorized um, the question and the answers probably won't. Uh, again, it's pretty effective because you are essentially creating a new um, correct answer. There is one problem with this strategy is that sometimes in flipping the answer into the stem, you can accidentally change the, uh, the you can change the item so much that it doesn't support the objective. It doesn't quite have the right difficulty or um, cognitive level that you're going for. Uh, so that's just something you have to be careful with if you're using it, but most of the time it works and it winds up being, leading to very effective um, clones. Okay, so if we could have the next slide. The next strategy, if you can't create a new answer, um, is to sort of change the shape of the stem and change the shape of the item. Uh, this can also be in a shifting form style. I also use this um, in cloning when sometimes I'll encounter fairly weak items in the bank as created from the SME. As Lisa pointed out, sometimes you have brilliant SMEs who just aren't great writers. Um, and I'll use cloning to try and fix some of it. And so that's usually when I employ changing the stem. So here I have this sample, which two statements are true about brewing green tea? So A, it should be brewed at a maximum temperature of 175 degrees. B, it should be brewed at a maximum temperature of 195 degrees. C, it should be allowed to steep for one to three minutes. And D, it should be allowed to steep for three to five minutes. So this is, you know, as I said, not a very strong item. A smart test taker will know immediately that the correct answer is going to be a combination of A or B and C or D. Um, so it's not that challenging. Uh, and it's also just kind of a straight up memorization. So I would take this and I'd try and craft a little bit of a scenario and see if I can do something with the answer so it's not such a kind of choose one out of two. Um, so if I can have the next slide. So here, I just wrote a simple scenario making it look like a more traditional item that I like. Simple tea uses electric kettles to brew a variety of teas to order. Our customers requested a large plain green tea. Which brewing instructions should the burst to follow? 
And then we have the correct answer, A, steep for one to three minutes at a temperature of 175 degrees, B, steep for three to five minutes at a temperature of 195 degrees, C, steep for six to eight minutes at a temperature of 205 degrees, and D, steep for eight to 10 minutes at a temperature of 215. So now, it's a much stronger item. You know, the uh, candidate's gonna have a much harder time reasoning through it to get to the answer. It's just, if they, but if they know the information, it should be simple. Okay, so if we can get the next slide. All right, and then we have um, rewording or keyword swapping. This is actually the hardest um, strategy to pull off correctly because you're never quite sure if you've changed enough. Uh, and basically it's when you're stuck in a situation where you can't do anything else. It, there's no way of rewriting it, of um, changing the, or of changing the shape or creating a new answer. So um, I cheated a little bit this on this one and used a grammar sample because it's easy to do. Uh, but here we go. So we have read the following passage. The film was criticized for its dull writing, wooden acting, and for being too long. Which revision corrects the error in the sentence without changing the original meaning? And then we have the film was criticized for its dull writing, wooden acting, and excessive length. And so this question is just testing the candidate's ability to spot um, parallel construction in a list. It's a probably the thing that tripped up SAT students I used to tutor the most. Um, so to clone this item, I just swapped out all the keywords, changed the structure a little bit. So if I can have the next slide. Yeah, so now we have read the following passage. The employee was reprimanded for missing deadlines, ignoring emails, and late arrivals. It's basically the same question, but I have brand new words surrounding it. Um, and I kept kind of the same structure to all the distractors, and I kept the same structure to the correct answer. Um, so basically the same item, but we swapped out the keywords. Sometimes you're not going to have as much freedom as this, though. So in IT especially, where, and to I ran into it a lot with the IIA where certain keywords are very important. You can't change them. What you do then is you try and change as much surrounding the keywords as possible, um, and sometimes shifting the order and just shuffling the way it's written. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of writing the same sentence. Um, and so that's when I have to get real creative. But then there's always that question of, have I done enough? Um, so I use this as a last resort. And usually, before I get to keyword swapping, I will try and fail at least six other, at six other cloning strategies. It's just um, not the strongest, but it can be effective. OK, um, if I can have the next slide. So those were the major strategies I used. There are more, um, and sometimes I kind of blend them. Uh, but those are the big ones. Those are the ones that come up the most often. And now I just wanted to sort of give you some tips where if you're not cloning already uh, and you're thinking of using cloning as a strategy and sending them to professional writer, item writers, uh, these are the things that make it easier for me to come in um, to an area where I don't have that much expertise and create strong clones for you. Uh, first, as I said, it's give items the potential with the potential for new correct answers, the priority. This will mean screening through your item banks to look for the ones that have that ability to just shift and change. Um, ideally, you want ones where you don't have to change much in the stem. I've seen very effective clones where they only changed one word uh, and move, create a new correct answer. Um, but it requires a little digging. If your stem or your item bank's just too large and you really don't want to spend the time to do with that, that's okay. To do that, that's okay. Just understand that not all of your items are going to be able to use the new answer cloning strategies and we'll have to employ some of the other ones. Um, if applicable, uh, provide a reference with each item and you know make sure the cloner has access to the reference material. This could be a little tricky for some of the big technology tests, they're supposed to be based on years of experience in the field, so there aren't quite references, but 
do what you can with that. In most cases, uh, try to have a, a reference that the item writer can dive into and just look for new answers. And then finally, and this is probably the most helpful, uh, if you don't already, require item writers provide rationale statements for every option. Um, and this, these are just statements that explain why each one's correct, each item is, option is either correct or incorrect. And um, I have samples on the next slide, so if I have the next slide, please. Um, so here we're going back to the stock market example that I had um, previously. And there are a lot of different formats for providing rationale, but this is one I kind of like. Um, for each statement, you have something like the answer is 100% correct because the payout ratio measures the amount of earnings paid to shareholders as dividends. If the ratio is too high, the dividend may be unstable. Um, so it's just a simple couple of sentences explains what it is. Uh, the important thing, though, then are the incorrect answers. They should be just as detailed as the correct answer. So I have B, this answer is 100% incorrect because the price to earnings ratio measures how expensive a stock is relative to its earnings and has no bearing on dividend payments. So with all of this, I can dive into the item and see if there's a way for me to change it up to make one of these other answers correct, or it might give me an idea for changing the shape. Um, all of my best item clones have had rationale that are kind of this detail. Um, so it's just, and it's not too hard to work it into your process. You just ask the writers to include it in the notes somewhere. Um, and if I had one big takeaway from this, it's if you're going to launch a cloning um, project, go ahead and, or if you're going to launch, use cloning, go ahead and start including rationale. Okay, so that wraps up sort of the the quick introduction to cloning that I had prepared. I'll turn it back over to uh, Jamie, and then we can start fielding some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, we've got a, a number of different questions that came up. And um, first, one of the first questions is, how many items need to be cloned? So Lisa or Patrick, would, would either of you like to take that? I, I can also chime in. I can take that, Jamie. OK. I, I think it's up to you to determine the need and the need being based on what you're trying to achieve. So whether that's a reserve form, whether that's a specific set of, you know, a domain or a subtext, subtopics from uh, your content specification outline where uh, you just don't have quite enough items, you have item writers that write for other sections that are favorites and you have maybe <laughs> One section that's a little bit tough to write for, that may be what you're trying to achieve. Um, really focusing on maybe a higher level content, uh, proficiency level items. So I, I think it really depends. There's not a specific number that you need or percentage of a form or, or anything like that. It, it's up to you and what your gap is or what you're trying to move forward. Or at least that's how uh, we made our decisions. Okay, great. Um, another question was, um, do you pre-test clones or do you rely on the original stats? I can take that one as well from our perspective, and I would say a little bit of both. Um, if it's a very minor change, um, you could reuse the statistics, um, but again, uh, being a former auditor, um, I like to spot check. So um, in some cases, we could have relied on the statistics, but we chose to uh, pretest and, and see how they were doing to make sure, because this was our first time through it as well, we wanted to make sure that the statistics were holding or improving. And then if we have, if we made some substantial changes, um, we certainly wanted to pretest those items. So um, again, there's, uh, my, I spoke a little bit about there's quite a bit of flexibility in cloning to make it adjust to and fit your model. Um, you certainly can use the statistics, but if you'd like to spot check or recheck or pre-test items with significant changes, that may be um, the conservative approach as well. Great. Um, so Patrick, here's one for you. Have you had much success with passage-based reading items and trying to clone those? You know, we haven't actually been called upon to uh, to clone many passage-based reading items. 
um, we did sort of when yeah on a writing project we did for a composition exam um, they, they weren't traditional clones but we have used passages to sort of approach several different grammar points um, and you know being an English major I can always find a different question to ask about a passage uh, but I could see where that would be really effective actually if you could have the passage and then a slightly different question that that would be really evil because the uh, the cheaters are just going to go, oh, it's this passage, and not pay that much attention. So I think that, those could be really effective. I just, no one sent me one to clone yet. OK. <laughs> um, here's one that, well, there was a couple questions about, you know, how do you catch cheaters with clones, using clones? And I think that uh, the strategy here is, you know, if, if that's your objective, to try to catch people who may have pre-knowledge of your existing items, you may want to. Uh, select a certain percentage of your items on a test, let's say 20, and clone those items and re republish the test with the cloned items. You can then look at the performance of those items against individuals and set a threshold to say, OK, if 19 out of you know, 20, uh, 20 of the items, if they've got those items wrong because they're using the, the old key, then it's likely that they had prior knowledge. So we're going to um, invalidate their scores. So it, it's a matter of figuring out you know, the number of items that you want to use and clone, um, and then setting a threshold to say, OK, at this point, anyone who you know, answered 19 out of 20, or whatever that number is, um, according to the old key, we're going to invalidate the score. So it becomes a, a policy decision. Um, let me see. Yeah, and if you're going to use. Yeah, if you're going to use that strategy, um, you really need to make sure all of your items are using that first new correct answer system or strategy that I pointed out. Yep, that's a good point. Um, so someone asked about sharing what item banking system you are using. Um, Lisa, I don't know if that's proprietary um, information. But you can share or um, are you sharing my email address at the end Jamie yes yeah if someone would like that information if they could uh, email me then then I can share more thank you oh, that's a great idea yeah and and really it, beyond just you know the name of the company and the vendor um, the components that are important with an item banking vendor are one that allows um, role-based access so I can define a set of items in a very specific, secure section of the bank where you know, I can sign those where only Patrick has access and he can't get to other parts of the bank. I can have limited access to specific items for my SME reviewers. Um, so it's, it's that type of control where cause I think I saw a question in the Q&A about, well, how do you separate it? Um, so making sure you have a tool that allows, um, for me, I want, because we're very, very global, I wanted to have something that's virtual, that's secure, that I can define by content and define by person and role. And then also uh, monitor our statistics in it. OK, great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll, I'll do one more question, and I'll direct it at Patrick a little bit. At what point should a cloned item be marked as an enemy item to help ensure a fairness for candidates? I would probably mark all the clone items as um, as enemies. I mean, because it's they they test. I mean, they test exactly the same thing. Uh, so I, our policy has usually been when we clone for. Uh, some of our other clients where we do original writing is that we, we just mark those as variants and make sure that they're on different forms and make sure they're on different tests. Uh, I don't, you could probably keep some on in the changing the shape, but again, I think they're still too close. I, I'd probably be, play it safe and mark all of your clones as enemies as the, of the originals. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So um, with that, I think we will close our webinar today. 
again, I want to thank you for attending. As I mentioned, we will have a recording of this um, session today. Someone also asked if we could um, also publish the Q&A. So we'll do that as well. All the questions that came in, um, we'll go ahead and answer those and, and include that with the email that we send out to everybody. Uh, just a reminder again, if you are interested, the Handbook of Test Security is available. This is a great reference. Um, there are a number of different articles and um, essays that are, are written by luminaries in the field and just um, some great best practices that organizations uh, can use in terms of beefing up test security within the organization. And um, as you'll notice below, if you order from Rutledge, there is a 20% discount code. You can use that. Again, uh, well, let's go to our next slide. So we want to thank everyone for attending. Um, remember our webinar that's happening next month, September 17th. And um, a special thank you to our presenters today, Lisa Hertzinger and Patrick Martin. If you would like to um, contact them directly, their emails are listed on this last page here. We hope to see you in social media. Um, look out for my blog that's coming out this week, Breaking Bad Habits with uh, Bad Item Writing Habits. Thank you so much.